to uh, everybody. Uh, well, good evening or you know, good, 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 any part of the day, depending on, on where you are. Uh, uh, everybody. Uh, well, on, on behalf of the National Research Foundation of Ukraine, let me welcome all those who joined our meeting today on who is going to join it. Uh, we feel that we need to share uh, with you uh, the information, results, and experience of being involved in a bottom-up initiative that was born 100 days ago, almost immediately after the uh, war in Ukraine started. Today, the National Research Foundation of Ukraine is honored to give the floor to the participants of the Ukrainian Science Reload Initiative, with whom we went from a, a state of shock to working out specific tasks aimed at one common goal to help Ukrainian research community during the terrible challenges of the war. In order to turn our communication into a dialogue mode, please ask your questions uh, in the comments below our post on Facebook. Uh, we will uh, we'll respond to them uh, after the event. And now let me introduce our first speaker, Yuri Halavka, head of the Department of General Chemistry and Chemistry of Materials uh, at Yuri Fitkovich Chernovtsi National University. Yuri, you're most welcome. Thank you very much, Olga. Thanks a lot to the National Scientific Fund uh, that really provides us this floor, actually, and provides support for, for scientists in such difficult conditions. And uh, when we talk about our initiative, uh, it emerged actually as a response to the Russian invasion. And uh, our first idea was actually to raise awareness of the global community that, to, to the threat that Ukrainian scholars actually experience and actually to uh, support also uh, scholars who stay, stay in Ukraine, who, who were not able to live abroad uh, and who can still continue the scientific work or uh, teaching activities in, in the university. And uh, we uh, actually, uh, a group of uh, different people from different background, from different organizations, from different initiatives. And uh, when we started, uh, we started actually with a petition uh, that asked for uh, remote positions for Ukrainian uh, researchers who can be remotely uh, hired uh, to work on Western or any other country's projects remotely. Uh, so to provide some support for, to those people who, who, who still uh, in Ukraine. Uh, we have more than 400, uh, uh, 4,000 people who signed that petition and became a bit uh, popular. But then we also turned into other activities and some other activities included uh, actually collection the, the list of people who want to work remotely. So we actually grabbed more than 500 uh, uh, records of, of people who, who is willing to work remotely from Ukraine in um, international uh, projects, actually, including all types of, of uh, science, all types of branches of science and so on. Uh, the third uh, activity was actually to provide some analytical um, materials, some uh, feedback, some policy papers on what's going on in Ukraine, uh, in young science, for example, uh, how it was affected by the war and what can be done actually, showing some cases, showing some possible schemes to support Ukrainian science in such uh, difficult times. Uh, the fourth activity was actually to uh, study uh, the needs of uh, Ukrainian scientists. And there uh, was a large survey uh, conducted, uh, which will be presented now by Anastasia Lutsenko. And also the fifth uh, direction that we used to, to, to uh, uh, work on was uh, actually support of different foreign uh, media uh, related to science, first of all, but also others, uh, to describe the war, to describe the cases of scientists during the war, uh, to provide 
uh, state of the art information of what's going on in science uh, in Ukraine in such uh, difficult times. Uh, I really uh, thank uh, to all uh, people who joined our initiative and today we would like to discuss first the results of our survey and then several uh, uh, people who actually joined us from the beginning will share their experience and also thoughts on different aspects of our initiative. And with this, I would like to introduce Anastasia Lutsenko, who was actually, uh, who is the leader of the uh, team that uh, conducted the survey, actually, and she will present us uh, results of this survey uh, about the needs of Ukrainian researchers in uh, our situation. Please, you're welcome. Uh, thank you, Yuri. Uh, thank you for hosting me here. And uh, uh, yes, my name is Anastasia Zilutsenko. I'm from the Kiev Polytechnic, oh, sorry, Kiev Academic University. And right now I'm the visiting researcher at Max Planck Institute for Innovation and Competition. And within this initiative, uh, Myself and the team of uh, five, so six all together, we have um, completed the research. And uh, let me just share the screen to talk more about the, um, the actual outcomes. So uh, just uh, tell me if you see the screen and all is good. Oh, wait a second. Sure. Yes, we can see it. Yeah, um, just share this. This my apology. Just two seconds because it doesn't. Um, yeah. Okay, so it should be okay now. Um, so um, our initiative was for uh, it actually emerged in the very beginning of the project after we had our first calls and uh, Veronica Romero, one of our um, team members, she um, extended to UA Science Reload team members. She started the research on finding out uh, what are the needs uh, in terms of the remote uh, positions for the researchers. And we found out that we need to have a more elaborated instrument to actually understand what is the, the profile of the researcher at war in Ukraine and uh, what are the needs of this researcher. So to address this, we have um, developed a questionnaire, uh, which uh, is actually targeted at um, answering uh, these certain questions. So we'll talk about them in a bit, um, uh, a bit later in this presentation. So to begin with this project, we have, um, as you can see from the screen, we have over 10 organizations that have been involved. Uh, so Kiev uh, Academic uh, University, uh, Yuri Fitkovich uh, National in University in Chernivtsi. We also have the uh, Club of Economists, Kiev National uh, University of Taras Shevchenko, National Academy of Science, uh, CNEO, uh, are named after Hetman, and um, Agency of European Innovations, and GEO. We also have international organizations such as the um, um, University of Utah Health, and we also talk, um, have um, Ukrainian Emerging Leaders Program representatives in our team, and uh, so on. So it's the pan-Ukrainian and international initiative. So our topic was um, of the research was um, uh, formulated around understanding um, what are those needs of the researchers and uh, so we can address them the best with policy, with uh, specific positions we can offer and uh, so on. So to begin with, uh, the survey itself, uh, it was targeted at scientists that are in Ukraine uh, with a bit of interest in those who have left Ukraine, but overall uh, it's uh, the research that is aiming to uh, provide the overview of um, what's going on with the researchers within the borders of Ukraine. So the uh, research has been uh, conducted over a course of four weeks in April, and we have collected all, almost 2,200 uh, uh, responses from the researchers. Uh, the um, uh, research has been conducted with the use of Lime survey platform that has also been provided uh, uh, to us by the uh, founder of the organization. So they, they provided this to us almost free of charge. 
and uh, so the questionnaire itself has 38 questions and it consists of some general information about respondents, uh, some questions on personal needs and um, those needs that are related to the um, research activities. So with uh, our findings, uh, to begin with, the portraits is uh, rather normal. So it's uh, almost 70% of women who have uh, submitted their forms and about 33% of um, male respondents. Uh, when we talk about the age, uh, it's normally from 31 to 50. So that this is the largest part of the Gaussian, if we talk about that. And uh, we also talk about that a two, well, about a third of our researchers, they have two children, uh, about 40% have one child, and another third has um, about, uh, has no children, sorry. And um, among all of them, uh, we have 54% of researchers who actually have adult children, which uh, to a certain extent um, affects their decision on leaving the country because of their uh, old uh, adult children. And uh, when we talk about the uh, um, special needs, we should um, point out that 43% of researchers has, have stated that they have relatives that, uh, that need special care, including people with disabilities and elderly uh, relatives and so on. And uh, we also need to point out that um, almost all of the researchers have pointed out that their um, financial situation has been uh, shaken by the uh, uh, war. So 84% of researchers have stated that they have uh, their uh, financial situation has worsened as the war began. And when we talk about the uh, um, other side of the uh, portrait, when we talk about the job positions, so 54% of researchers are university staff, and also, uh, um, and it's their main work, and 32% uh, of respondents uh, that are um, researchers at the research institute. So the first one is the university staff, and the researchers are that are belong to not belong but uh, work for the research institutes. It's the third. So this is the normal distribution which we have in Ukraine. Uh, Sixty-four percent of respondents, sixty-three percent of respondents. Um, they work at the higher education institutions and 22 respondents work for the National Academy of Science of Ukraine. So when we compare that to the other research uh, initiatives such as Science for Ukraine and um, the um, research that Nico Romero has done pr uh, prior to our initiative, uh, we see that it's uh, very much related and the data is congruent. So therefore reliable. And 74% um, of scientists are uh, not engaged in the activities other than doing research or teaching. So this is their main uh, source of income and uh, their professional interests. And uh, it, what is uh, also essential is that over 80% of respondents have stated that um, they still receive sa their salaries uh, uh, at the uh, institutions where they work, which means that the uh, system we have, the scientific and education system, when we talk about the higher education, is pretty resilient um, when facing such uh, shock, uh, shocks and turbulences as war. So when we talk about the current location of scientists, uh, we, obviously, we, we obviously talk about a lot of relocation and the main cities that uh, have received most of the researchers are Cherkasy, Lviv, Kharkiv, and Vinitsa. And uh, also about 20% of researchers remain or have moved to Kiev. And about 50% of respondents have mentioned that um, um, they have not changed their place of residence due to war. Uh, about 40% have stated that they uh, had to leave uh, their uh, normal place where they stay. Uh, and um, about 15% of respondents have said it's, it, that this move has been to uh, the territories which are outside Ukraine, so abroad. 
And we also talk about the um, um, whether there are any uh, um, uh, any war events taking place in the territories where those researchers are residing. So we talk about 54 percent percent of researchers that are staying in Ukraine in the locations where there is, there is no uh, hostilities and 7% of scientists are still in the areas where it is dangerous for them to be due to um, war events taking place. And we also talk about the, uh, uh, if we talk about 15% of scientists who have left Ukraine and moved abroad, we talk about uh, Germany and Poland being the, the country, those countries receiving the most of the researchers. But it is essential to mention here that we only talk about the migration, but not about the job positions researchers have, uh, regardless whether we talk about Ukraine or those researchers who are abroad at the moment. This is just about the migration. And when we talk about the uh, possibility to, to com continue their work um, at the level they had uh, during the pre-war times, 73% of researchers have stated that they have difficulties with um, com continuing their work uh, at the same um, scale as they did before the war. And about 30%, 27% of researchers, they stated that they can, actually can continue their work. And uh, when we talk about the 73% of those uh, who cannot continue their activities, we talk about such reasons as if like uh, personally, those are uh, lack of interest and apathy and also the uh, lack of feeling being safe. And uh, when we talk about the professional aspects of, um, um, of the, um, sorry, the reasons that uh, affect uh, researchers, those are that uh, uh, they need specific environments to work, for example, labs or um, their offices to continue their work, or it's also technical, uh, those are technical issues such as interruptions with the internet communication or lack of uh, electricity or, or water supply. So some basic needs that need to be covered and uh, when we talk about the participation uh, that researchers had uh, in their uh, um, um, grant activities um, over the last three years, oh, sorry, uh, we should we have distributed, uh, we have formed the questions. So the uh, projects that are financed by the EU uh, and projects that are supported and financed by the government of Ukraine. Those are the largest groups, um, and they have uh, 25 and 29 percent, respectively. So what we can see is that over the past three years and the past decade, Ukraine has been doing a lot of work uh, in uh, uh, becoming a, um, in getting more financing from the European Union. And as we can see from the graph, we are. Um, substantially successful in this endeavor because we have almost the same amount received from the EU compared to what we receive from our government. And we also talk about about 11% uh, of projects that are, are um, sponsored and funds financed, financed by the business. Other projects, uh, including self-finance, are 16% uh, and uh, we also have about 60% of researchers that uh, do not take part in any projects. Those, those researchers are usually from the higher education institutions and they either have their focus on uh, teaching or they are at their junior positions and they didn't participate in any research yet. And we also talk, when we talk about the state financing um, in Ukraine, we should mention that about 30% of participants have indicated that the financing has been canceled due to obvious reasons because financing has been forwarded to the military needs covering and um, so on. So um, this funding has been uh, canceled for the researchers and obviously it has affected their financial stability as well to a certain extent. We did not study that part yet. We just did the umbrella research to see uh, where we should um, allocate our interest further to understand a specific question. So this would be another topic to research 
Uh, when we talk about the needs of the researchers, uh, personal needs obviously uh, uh, include some basic needs uh, like financial support, um, reestablishing and building some new social networks, and also the uh, uh, stable and uninterrupted internet access. Those are the major needs of the researchers. And when we talk about the uh, professional needs, uh, those are access to the information and data, access to scientific literature, um, possibility to work uh, in the research projects right now or to be engaged in the near future. And also we talk about the uh, um, needs to have mobility programs for the researchers, because when we talk about those who have left, uh, Ukraine, as I said before, it's not necessarily that they have their job positions, so they are losing their uh, scientific potential by not being involved in any uh, activities outside the country. And the same when we talk about the researchers in Ukraine, so having some um, remote positions to uh, uh, or research projects or which they can join remotely from Ukraine uh, right now. And and we also talk about the, the need of uh, in communication that researchers are facing. And um, what is essential is that we do not talk about the long term planning. Researchers are concentrated on facing and uh, addressing their needs here and now and in the near future, but not in the long term perspective. And uh, we also talk about the uh, possibilities to work voluntarily. Uh, um, to help Ukraine in its uh, rebuilding and um, strengthening the defense capacities. So as we can see from the pie chart below, we have three quarters of researchers. Um, uh, I think I have wrong colors here, my apology for that. Uh, so 75% of researchers do uh, uh, ready are ready to help and 25% are not ready to do so. My apology for the wrong coloring, but it's obviously not the result of our research. So um, this is the overview of what we have and uh, the researchers do understand the need in uh, working towards strengthening the defense cap cap capabilities uh, of Ukraine and obviously being involved in uh, various projects where they have their expertise on helping uh, Ukraine in its uh, way to a better future. So this is pretty much it. And uh, thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, I'm more than glad to respond. And yes, thank you so much. And I think I should stop here. Thank you, Anastasia. Uh, thanks for this uh, very insightful uh, survey and results. And with this, I would like to move further to our other speakers who were with us from the beginning. And now I invite Yulia Bezveshenko, who is now in Stanford University as a fellow uh, of the Ukrainian Emerging Leaders Program. And she was involved uh, very much in the policy advisory activities. So please, Yulia, it's your time to speak. Thank you for having me here and uh, thank you National Research Foundation for this event. So uh, from the very beginning, uh, the policy advocacy consulting part was very important for me and for our initiative because we have this experience for at least eight years in Ukraine, understanding that it's very important for scientists to articulate clearly their needs, uh, possible instrument that can work for them, that can help them. And it's also important to help our country to be able to articulate such needs on the international level. So the uh, survey which was presented but by Anastasia Lutsenko is an important part of uh, our um, activities in this um, in this policy making exercises, because uh, we understand that uh, it's very important to provide data, to provide the real picture of what is happening on the ground. Uh, we know that uh, the world uh, had an experience of helping researchers at risk uh, in previous years, unfortunately. Uh, for example, the last case was from Afghanistan um, for uh, researchers and scholars <clears throat> who were fleeing from uh, that country. 
Uh, but it's very important and was very important to understand during the first days of the war and it's very important to understand now that Ukrainian situation, uh, Russian full-scale invasion uh, has uh, uh, put a very uh, specific uh, um, frame for the situation. Uh, what we, what I mean, uh, the first one, what Anastasia showed within this uh, presentation and this story is that the majority of Ukrainian researchers remain in Ukraine, either because of personal, legal or professional reasons. Uh, it means that like, it's very important to help researchers uh, Ukrainian who are outside the country, but we understand that, <clears throat> that it's also very important to find out, to build uh, to implement uh, instruments which can help Ukrainian researchers to remain within their profession uh, within Ukraine. So uh, the second important thing is to build uh, like the set both of emergent uh, uh, instruments which can be not so easy to implement for the institutions which propose them uh, because uh, we understand that like uh, the emergency uh, creates the moment when people do what is easy to do. For example, uh, collect uh, additional money and put additional money for the instruments which are there. For example, additional positions, for example, uh, instruments of mobility and so on. But we understand that this case uh, need some new instruments which can be useful both today and both in the next uh, days after war. Also, we uh, are involved in different uh, working groups, uh, discussions, consultancy, advocating both inside Ukraine and outside Ukraine. Um, as you may know, in Ukraine, we have a National Council on um, uh, Rebuilding of Ukraine after the war. And it also contained the part uh, on science and education policy. And we are involved in discussion about science part in order to help our country to articulate clearly for international partners and donors what we need uh, in sense of instruments, in sense of financial and non-financial help. Also, we are involved in conversations with our international uh, partners and friends who are interested in understanding and better understanding what is happening and what can help. And we will be happy to uh, remain uh, doing that. And the last but not the least part is the following. As we are pursuing, so we are we're trying to persuade uh, all the Ukrainian actors during uh, last eight, eight, eight years that uh, the future of Ukraine is uh, as strong, resilient, uh, uh, democratic country is uh, uh, possible only in the case if we build a uh, knowledge-based economy and knowledge-based society. Now there's a moment when it should be emphasized within Ukraine as the um, major line for its uh, rebuilding via modernization, via technology-driven economic development. And also it's important that uh, this narrative uh, should be well uh, articulated and well understood on the international level. Because I believe for um, like global West, it's clearly understandable that an ener energy independence, uh, economical stability and resilience uh, can be built only on this fundament. But it's not, it was not as uh, like that during previous 30 years. So we are trying also to emphasize on that. And the last thing is that uh, I think that it's a moment when very important to involve as much as possible international support, both in financial and non-financial instruments, because it's a huge moment when uh, Ukrainian researchers can build their capacity to be highly competitive in, in, in the international on the international level, to build the network all over the world to build a uh, under better understanding of Ukrainian narrative and Ukrainian uh, capability of uh, doing research and providing uh, important uh, input. And I think that uh, our initiative, the one of such platforms, which can be used for building such networks, such interaction, such instruments of support in future. Thank you.
Thank you, Julia. And uh, I'd like to invite the uh, next speaker, which uh, who, who is Irina Yhorchenko. She is a mathematician from the uh, uh, National Academy of Science. And she experienced now actually what is to be displaced person in uh, Poland. Uh, so please, the floor is yours and uh, you're welcome. Your, your microphone is off. Uh, hello, I'm a mathematician. I work uh, at the Institute of Mathematics of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine. And uh, at the moment, I stay at the um, Institute of Mathematics of the Polish Academy of Science. Uh, I arrived uh, here at the beginning of March. Uh, maybe uh, my place, uh, where I live is not the most dangerous, but uh, nearby buildings were explicitly named as targets by Russian top officials. So uh, my uh, own apartment is okay now, but unfortunately uh, my first apartment I sold many years ago, it was not okay, got eroded. Uh, and uh, my experience uh, of a displaced scientist is that uh, I'm very thankful for the to the Polish Academy of Sciences. They uh, gave me a free accommodation for the first uh, period of my stay because uh, accommodation, you know, that accommodation in all European countries is very very expensive. And uh, maybe no Ukrainian scientist can pay for the accommodation from their salaries or from their saving also from anything. And uh, my first two months I was, uh, I started applying for grants, but uh, I was living uh, at the expense of my salary at the Institute, but later uh, they, uh, um, our government uh, first proposed a law then uh, that allowed distant work, but uh, with other hands they uh, adopted uh, some uh, resolution that didn't allow uh, any distant work for people who are abroad. So they do not allow paying money, uh, basically, to people who are abroad, uh, unless they are, have a status of so-called internship. And in this case, a position uh, could be preserved and uh, some tiny portion of the salary could be paid. Uh, so after this living basically with my own money, I got a grant uh, from the money provided to the Polish Academy of Sciences by the American Academy of Sciences, the Royal Society. They decided that it's more efficient to support people in Poland than to bring them to Britain and uh, United States. Uh, my um, estimate is that probably it is possible to support like 10 people in Poland uh, for the money that are necessary to bring one person to uh, the United Kingdom or uh, the US. Uh, so this is a very good experience and uh, I also continued applying for grants. Uh, I didn't uh, win all the grants I applied for and at the moment I have a strong chances uh, to obtain a grant uh, from the institute money that are leftovers from the travel money saved uh, that weren't used uh, due to COVID-19 epidemic. And uh, the Institute of Mathematics had to apply to the relevant grant agencies uh, for the possibility to relocate this money from travel to salary of the Ukrainian scientists. And 
and I hope that I will be able to obtain this grant for a year, but uh, at the moment it's not fixed yet. Uh, so uh, I must say about uh, these grants that uh, there is a very false uh, idea, especially in Ukraine, that everybody who moves abroad, all scientists, all university teachers who move abroad, are able to obtain such grants. This is not true. Uh, for example, I attended uh, the beginning of this month a meeting of Ukrainian scientists in Poland with the presidents of the Academies of Sciences. Uh, the, there were uh, president of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine, uh, president of the Polish Academy of Sciences, and many European uh, presidents of the Academy of Sciences who discussed uh, how to help Ukrainian scientists. And uh, there were also representatives from the uh, National Academy of Sciences uh, of the United States. And uh, they cited that there are 250 sci Ukrainian scientists at Polish institutions, uh, but only 50 something obtained the special grants. Uh, from the program intended for the Ukrainian scientists. So competition is very tough. And uh, all these grants are not uh, very large. So some people think that uh, grants mean very good living. For example, uh, the grant I'm going, I hope I will have uh, minus uh, accommodation, minus uh, taxes will be a little bit, even a little bit less than I received in Ukraine. But uh, it's okay, it's possible to live on this money in Poland, but I understand that uh, for people who have several children or for people who, care, who have uh, many dependents, uh, I don't know how they will be able to live. So it is necessary for all help to scientists, it is necessary to take into account that some scientists uh, may have dependents. They uh, weren't able to live in Ukraine, just so they need larger accommodation, they need uh, money to for children, they need money for their disabled or old relatives, and so on. And, uh, and the meeting of this president of the academy were asked what are the problems. Uh, and one of the problems in Poland is that we are basically not allowed to leave Poland at all. No reason. So there are no good excuses. If uh, 90 days of uh, Schengen visa will expire, we have either to stay in Poland or go to Ukraine and uh, lose possibilities of uh, temporary protection, lose possibilities to enter the Schengen countries uh, for the nearest 90 days. Uh, and also there are no reasons, no funerals of close relatives, no medical purposes, nothing. And uh, obviously, no, no, we are not allowed to attend, for example, conferences, and nobody knows what to do, probably. So uh, many um, legal decisions uh, and many international um, arrangements were taken very fast. And obviously people didn't think about all the aspects of these arrangements and uh, they are not going to. We were told that nobody is going to correct uh, this issue. So it's, you have the situation and you have to live with this situation, that's all. And uh, I think that for many Ukrainians, uh, now it will be very, they would think it's not a good idea to come to Poland if they need to travel. And uh, also I would like to say about problems, uh, that are much larger problems for people who stay in Ukraine. Uh, Anastasia told about uh, deterioration, serious deterioration of 
financial situation of all these people, even people who are in safe locations. But uh, I envisage a huge problem not founded for at the moment. It's a huge uh, redundancy of university teachers because uh, many universities uh, won't be able to attract sufficient amount of uh, new students. And this is especially, that will affect especially teachers who teach at the first year of uh, the universities, they are the teachers of uh, fundamental subjects. So introductory subjects, they are mathematics, physics, uh, chemistry and humanities for not, uh, for, for students who are not specialized, specialized. And probably it is uh, necessary to do something to help these people because it's very difficult to prepare new teachers of these subjects. Uh, and uh, now these people will be out of work, a lot of these people. Uh, I'm speaking about thousands of people. It's not like one person, two people, and so on. And uh, also I um, care specifically about mathematicians because uh, many of for these mathematical courses will be given to economists, to engineers, to anybody, because uh, these university managers will think that it's not necessary to ensure quality education, it's necessary to make, have like nominal uh, education, so like courses are delivered and that's all. Uh, so my uh, conclusion is that uh, there are many problems of the Ukrainian scientists because of war, and uh, we have to envisage new problems that are going to arise. Thank you. Thank you, Irina. Uh, and uh, we also have some information regarding the remote uh, positions for Ukrainians. Uh, first of all, we would like to uh, tell that recently uh, some people were actually employed in Italian, for example, university uh, remotely, so it is possible in principle, and we know that there are also some other cases going on that uh, scientists are trying to a force or to motivate their university administration or institutional administration to consider and to provide a legal support uh, that will uh, open such uh, possibilities to uh, hire uh, Ukrainian researchers who are still in Ukraine uh, to work remotely on scientific projects. And uh, it's actually uh, up to administrative uh, personnel at the moment, I guess, because we, we know that there are people who would like to hire such people. There are, we have uh, more than 500, as I mentioned before, records of, of people from different branches of science uh, that would like to work remotely in international projects. So it's basically about agencies, it's about the uh, university and maybe on the government level, uh, there should be decisions to make such interaction, to make such things possible. Uh, and uh, we need to understand that uh, it's actually could be more efficient if uh, we spend money this way because uh, it's much cheaper uh, to do this in Ukraine when people stay in Ukraine. So uh, there may be more people covered with such support, uh, they could still continue and contribute to, to, towards teaching, for example, towards other activities that we mentioned before, and it would be very much beneficial. What we also have to admit that uh, we need also to develop um, Ukrainian professional societies, basically focus on different branches of science and education as well, uh, because we know that several um, supporters like uh, in chemistry i can mention uh, royal society of chemistry and also 
um, a European thematic uh, chemistry network uh, that both were looking for some societies, for some uh, contact points actually within the country uh, to provide support, to, to, to talk to people, to, to discuss the needs and, and so on. And this has to be supported as well. So the structuring of Ukrainian science, uh, organizational capacity uh, of uh, different societies that would be actually uh, very, very helpful and very, very beneficial. And I uh, give floor back to Olha now. Uh, please uh, tell us about what the uh, National Research Foundation is uh, doing in this uh, direction. Thank you, Yuri, and thank, uh, thanks a lot to all, everyone who joined our meeting today and special thanks to all the speakers who actually joined um, our event, our meeting uh, from different time zones, which was, you know, complicated for many of you. So thank, thank you very much. Just, well, the time is almost up. A couple of words about the, the um, National Research Foundation of Ukraine, which I have the honor to represent. So, well, one of the key tasks uh, of uh, the foundation, uh, well, from the beginning of the war and literally until today, uh, uh, has been looking for ways to provide grant support for research and developments for our projects, funding of which was suspended due to the, uh, well, uh, beginning of the war and allocation of the funds provided for this purpose to the reserve fund of the state budget of Ukraine. However, uh, this task, among other aspects, um, is related to learning about the state and capabilities of our grantees to continue their research based on the general situation in the uh, scientific sphere now in Ukraine. The foundation addressed 169 teams of, uh, well, uh, uh, of our projects with questions about institutional, organizational, scientific, methodological capacity to continue their research under the limitations of war. Based on the processing of uh, their answers, uh, well, we can state that only 57 out of them they are, uh, are ready to continue working right now. 62 can continue to work under certain circumstances and 50 on sets that at this stage, they uh, will not be able to continue their research. Uh, well, uh, that means just well under the circumstances of the military actions. So the foundation also appeals to the Ministry of Education and Science of Ukraine and the Presidium of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine and uh, of June the 1st uh, this year. Well, we have the information that 18 institutions of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine suffered most, suffered tremendously from the actions of the aggressor. And 18 institutions of higher education uh, have so far been temporarily transferred to other regions of Ukraine where they can carry out uh, their uh, principal activities. Uh, besides, uh, uh, one of the foundation's initiatives, which uh, I would like to tell you about, was to document the uh, military crimes uh, as for destruction of buildings and premises of our grantees and actually influencing the, the, the life of uh, researchers. So we uh, collected more than 20 video and photo recordings, crimes committed by the Russian Federation against educational and scientific institutions in Ukraine. Uh, so, well, as, uh, as you can see, uh, well, it, in this war, the enemy is uh, deliberate, deliberately trying to destroy not only the infrastructure, not only the military objects of Ukraine, but also to destroy, uh, well, uh, our scientific and educational facilities, uh, which once again proves that, uh, well, uh, science cannot be considered apolitical or just, well, uh, beyond any politics, because the enemy has been well, trying to deprive us of the rights to, uh, well, self-determination to the right of conducting research uh, to, uh, of the right of well, educating students and uh, well finally uh, the rights uh, to ac access the uh, well, European Union and uh, access um, international research communi uh, community 
So once again, thank you so much uh, for your interest uh, in the Ukrainian Science Reload Initiative and uh, in our online event. The recording of the event can be well, easily, I hope, easily found on our Facebook page and on the YouTube channel. And we hope to see you soon at our events. Thank you. Goodbye.